Hello, my name is Daniel Kremers. This talk is about deep, direct visual slam. Most of the work I'm presenting here has been done by current and former members of my team, in particular Nan Yang, Roy Wang, Jacob Engel, and Jörg Stückler. Visual slam, or often called structure from motion, structure and motion has a long-standing history. This is one of the pioneers, Erwin Kruppa, and more than a hundred years ago, he proved that if you observe five corresponding point pairs in two images, this allows us to recover the relative motion of the camera and the 3D location of these points. Following in Krupa's footsteps, the research community in computer vision has developed what I call the classical pipeline of camera-based reconstruction starting in the 70s, 80s and over the last decades. This has been refined and put to great performance. As we see, this pipeline follows closely in Krupa's footsteps. Krupa said he assumes we have two images, so we take two consecutive images. Then we extract points because Krupa wanted points and corresponding points, so we associate points with descriptors like SIFT, SURF, BRIEF or some deep learning based descriptors in order to compute correspondence. And once we have a set of corresponding point pairs, then following Krupa, we can recover the camera motion and the 3D structure by techniques like bundle adjustment. This is working quite impressively by now. Nevertheless, I believe it's always time to question even the pioneers. When you switch on a camera today, what you get are not actually two images, but a whole stream of images. Furthermore, what you get are not points, and certainly not corresponding point pairs, but you see colors or brightness values. So this raises the question, isn't there a way to get directly from these sensory data, the brightness values of our sensor, to a reconstruction of the 3D world and of the camera trajectory? These techniques are often called direct methods nowadays. The key difference, often people say you get points, you get points, what is the difference? Well, the key difference is that in classical key point based techniques, what you minimize ultimately is a geometric reprojection error. Bundle adjustment does exactly that. Whereas what we minimize in direct methods is a photometric color consistency error. So the idea is find a reconstruction in the world of the world and the camera trajectory such that the colors are consistent from one image to the next. And this is the driving term. What do we hope to gain by doing so? Well, anyone who works on sensor analysis can confirm that the more closely you work on the raw sensory data, the better your optimality and robustness results that you can expect. Why? Because you work directly on the sensory data so you can extract all available information and not just some heuristically pre-computed subset of points. In this talk, I will have two parts. I will first introduce direct visual slam approaches, and then I will look into more recent efforts where we leverage the predictive power of deep neural networks to boost the performance of direct slam methods. One of the first direct slam methods, and definitely to my knowledge, the first large scale capable direct slam approach, is a technique that we called LSD slam. This work was predominantly developed by Jacob Engel. My main contribution was only to provide the name LSD SLAM. I think this did help to boost its popularity. You know, typically works that have more catchy names tend to stick longer. The approach is rather sophisticated. Here's an overview of the technique. It starts with an input video on the top left that streams in, say, at 30 hertz. Uh, and then there are two uh, threads that are running in parallel on the CPU. One is tracking the camera motion and the other one is estimating the depths for a selected set of keyframes. And these keyframe depth maps are then fused into a world coordinate point cloud. What makes it large scale is the pose graph optimization that we do in parallel. Uh, this we adopted from lighter based SLAM techniques. It creates a trajectory that is consistent with the pairwise alignments of keyframes. 
What makes this direct? Let's look a little bit more into detail here. Say for the camera tracking, what we minimize to estimate the camera motion is a brightness consistency loss function, much like this one here, where we say find a rigid body motion, six parameters, psi modeling, rotation and translation of the camera, such that the keyframe intensity image and the current warp frame are optimally aligned in terms of color consistency. Since we're only estimating six parameters here, this can easily be done in a course to find linearization strategy, and this runs in real time on a single laptop a CPU, on the single core of a laptop CPU. On the other core, we can then do depth map estimation and put all together here. You see the system in action. Here's the camera, there's the laptop. It all runs in real time on the laptop CPU. And as you can see, we can recover fairly large scale environments. So not only a desktop environment, but a whole outdoor environment with cars, with tables and chairs, etc. And note that there is fairly little distortion in the reconstruction and in fact the aim of the remainder of the talk is predominantly to further boost the precision and further reduce the drift that we obtain. Here's another indoor reconstruction of LSD SLAM where we see that what we get is not dense reconstructions but what Jacob calls semi-dense for roughly 50% of pixels we get a depth value associated. Now LSD SLAM alternatingly estimated camera motion and 3D structure in two threads running in parallel. What we already noted from Kropa's work that is that this is really a chicken and egg problem. And so in the follow-up work, direct sparse odometry, Jacob actually proposed a solution where both are estimated jointly. Top left is the input video. You see we have people moving through the ca uh, camera. The system is extremely robust to such nuisances, to also very drastic illumination changes. On the bottom right, you see the reconstructed trajectory and the estimated point cloud. And again, we note that the drift is fairly sp small. Although we only use a single moving camera, in the end, when we get back to where we started, the re bicycle you see here is reconstructed twice. And as you see, there is a drift of roughly two or three meters on a distance of hundreds of meters. The question arises is how accurate is this method? What is really the quantitative performance of it? And this is admittedly one of the biggest challenges in computer vision today, especially in the deep learning age. How do we quantify performance of such methods? And there are different ways to tackle this problem. For example, you could create a simulated world and simulate input videos. Then you could measure the quantitative performance, but only in the simulated world. And I think we all agree that the world we live in is not a simulation. So what Jacob proposed is to take a lot of real-world videos in real-world environments, indoor and outdoor, with different lenses, uh, some more fisheye, some more perspective. All these videos are very diverse, but they all have one thing in common. They all loop back to where they started from. And this allows us, for every video, to quantify the overall drift. So we don't know where the camera was halfway through the sequence, but we know where it should be at the very end. And so the idea is if we have enough such videos, here we show evaluations on 500 sequences, if we have enough such videos, we can basically get one you know, measure in terms of scale drift, rotational drift and translational drift shown here. Top right is the translational drift, for example. And what we compare is we compare to what we considered the state of the art at the time, a key point based technique, a very powerful technique from a team in Zaragoza called Orb Slam. But you see that our approach, direct sparse odometry, significantly outperforms Orb Slam on this data set. Uh, you can read these numbers in many ways. For example, you can say what is the maximum error achieved for the best 300 sequences? On the x-axis is always the error. On the y-axis, we plot the sequences, the number of sequences where we achieve this error. And as you can see, whereas Orbslam has an error of six, DSO has an error of one. So we actually reduce the error by a factor of six. Similarly, if you wanted to impose a maximum error, say of two, how many out of 500 sequences can we track with that error? Orbslam can track about 100. We can track about 400, which implies that the robustness is increased, if you will, by a factor of four here. 
And this is similar for rotational error and scale drift. Dashed is always real time, solid is if you have a bit more compute. Deep networks have revolutionized computer vision for the last decade and they've really swept the field and replaced most classical techniques for, in image analysis. But yet one of the holy grails, I would say, of classical techniques to date is the reconstruction of the world from moving cameras. I don't want to go into detail about why that is, maybe because this is a very high dimensional space of conceivable solutions and conceivable inputs. There has been a lot of promising efforts over the last few years, starting around 2017. Uh, these are just a few representative works in this field, and despite their success, they've shown that you can use deep nets to recover camera motion 3D structure. But to date, most of these techniques do not exhibit state-of-the-art performance and tend to not outperform the classical techniques. Mostly this is, in my view, because they tackle it into a complete end-to-end -end fashion. In go the images, out comes the reconstruction and the trajectory. What we promote is hybrid techniques, where we basically start with a classical technique and then enhance it with deep network predictions on various levels. It turns out, for example, that just given a single image, you can predict the depths of the scene uh, based on training data. Here is a work by Kuznetsov and collaborators. We built up on this and proposed a new network architecture that we call StackNet. And as you can see, it provides significantly sharper predictions of depths. These predictions we can now integrate into a classical SLAM approach on two levels. First of all, we can initialize the depths maps with this depths prediction for each keyframe. And secondly, we can add a term in the loss function of a classical SLAM method where we say find a reconstruction of the world that is in some sense consistent with the prediction of the deep network. We did that and then we compared two classical SLAM methods. Here we show uh, some of the state-of-the-art stereo methods, stereo LSD SLAM, stereo ORP SLAM, stereo DSO, uh, on the sequences of the KIDI dataset. And in comparison here, the monocular method that we call deep virtual stereo odometry. The solid numbers are always the best performing number. And as you can see, the proposed method largely outperforms most of these stereo based methods, even though it uses only one of two cameras. And so you can see that the deep networks allow to compensate for the missing sensory information. And we'll see more of this in a second. In fact, you can go even deeper you can predict not only the depths, but given two consecutive keyframes, you can also predict the relative camera motion between the two and some notion of uncertainty. And all these predictions, I'll show in a second how we can integrate them into the SLAM approach, both on the front end tracking and in the back end optimization. We saw that a depth net can predict the depths for a keyframe. In addition, if we have a second frame, we can predict the relative camera motion between these two frames. And so we can warp the two images and train this whole approach with a self-supervised learning approach. So we don't need any ground truth label. Um, and what we use as a loss function is the classical brightness consistency. So the residual measures the brightness of the one image and the other one warped onto the first one. And typically, if you have a perfectly Lambertian world and a brightness consistency, this should be the right loss function. In practice, it is not. So due to aperture changes, we have often very different brightnesses, even for a Lambertian environment. Turns out we can use PoseNet to also predict that affine brightness transformation here with two parameters A and B that we can train a network to predict. And that way we can correct for the aperture changes and get a fairly good brightness consistency to train the neural network. Yet we all know that uh, the world we live in is not a perfectly Lambertian world. So for you know, examples like this one, when you have metallic structures, windows, translucent structures, etc., you can expect on these areas the brightness consistency will be violated. It turns out we can train a neural network to predict this kind of aleatoric uncertainty that we call sigma here for each keyframe. 
This was done in works, for example, by Alex Kendall and co-workers and by Maria Claude and co-workers in 2018. And so we can then use a self-supervised learning approach where we normalize this residual with the uncertainty, essentially downweighting those areas where we expect high uncertainty. And indeed, the train network predicts the uncertainty, as you can see, fairly well. So on the shiny areas, we get fairly high values of uncertainty. Also note, in the tree area, where you tend to have motion, you typically don't get color consistency. As I said, all these predictions of these networks are then uh, introduced into the SLAM approach, both on the front-end tracking and on the back-end optimization. The front-end tracking, we impose it uh, in form of a nonlinear factor graph for brightness consistency. And the back-end optimization, we basically have additional loss functions that impose consistency with the relative pose, with the depths, etc. Now we come to quantitative evaluation, so this approach called D3VO. First on the KIDI data set and also then on the Europe data set, we compare to one of the state-of-the-art uh, monocular depth networks called MonoDeps2. And as you can see, black is the best, blue is the second best. The proposed uh, D3VO approach outperforms the state-of-the-art here on monocular depth estimation by a significant margin. In addition, we obviously want to generalize beyond the environments where we trained, and so we apply the pre-trained network to the cityscapes dataset, and we see that even here, the predicted depth maps are fairly accurate, and in addition, the estimated uncertainty is also quite plausible here in the area of the large window, we get fairly high values of uncertainty. Now, let's look at visual odometry precision. First, we compared on the left to classical methods, to monocular orb slam and to stereo DSO, and we showed that the proposed monocular method actually outperforms these techniques by a significant margin. We also compared to uh, state-of-the-art deep learning approaches and show here as well we significantly outperform existing techniques. We go even further and we compare the proposed monocular method to existing mono, visual inertial and stereo inertial methods. And we see that D3VO provides state-of-the-art performance compared to stereo inertial methods like Basalt, even though it only leverages one single camera. And hence you can see once more that the deep networks compensate for the missing information, not having a second camera and not having an inertial sensor. Here is a comparison of reconstructions on a difficult sequence from Europe. The monocular approach DSO shows very noisy reconstructions because the trajectory is inaccurate. Uh, in, in contrast, D3VO shows a fairly crisp and sharp reconstruction because we get a significant boost in the odometry precision. To summarize, I talked about direct visual SLAM approaches and the idea of leveraging directly the intensity information in the input data, imposing color consistency and brightness consistency to drive the method. And in fact, the idea here is that the better you understand the sensory variations, the brightness variations, the more you can extract about camera motion and 3D structure. And then we essentially show that rather than us understanding the brightness variations, we can train deep networks to understand and model these brightness variations to further boost the precision of these direct methods. This can be deployed for autonomous systems, for example, in self-driving cars, to recover large-scale, highly accurate uh, models of the world and of the trajectories of the car in real time from the driving car with, as you see, fairly low-cost sensory information. In the end, for example, we show how much you can do with just one single moving camera. You can map the world at large scale. You can recover the location of your vehicle or of your sensor at extremely, uh, and to my knowledge, unprecedented uh, precision. 
And you can even leverage deep neural networks to create a semantic understanding of the world as shown here, where we can distinguish about 20 classes of objects, drivable area, cars, vegetation, uh, sidewalks, pedestrians, etc. I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to a lively Q&A session.